All right, welcome to the video lecture for Wednesday. Um, sorry I'm not in class. As mentioned before, I'm in Missoula currently, so we'll do hopefully probably a 15 to 20 minute brief overview of breaking theory here. Um, no major announcements today. For breaking, you're gonna find uh, breaking is just a huge piece of automotive design because of safety issues. And so we're just going to throw a couple categories to uh, <clears throat> those safety issues right here. And one is crash resistance versus crash avoidance. Obviously, we would love to have crash avoidance as our uh, primary means of safety, just that we're not even in the accident altogether. You can see here, this is just some comparison of some videos. Uh, just for safety tests and just showing safety improvements there. Those safety improvements are really more crash resistance though. So if we're looking at airbags and rollover bars, you're going to get um, basically improving safety in the case of an accident. So um, <clears throat> braking really comes in through crash avoidance there. And so we'll look at kind of the braking side of things. Uh, this video here is... Uh, Basically, just a video. I won't show all of this, but it's about uh, breaking. Every day, the Top Gear post bag is filled to overflowing with hundreds of letters asking the same question. Why, oh why, oh why? When the speed limit in this country is 70 miles an hour, a car manufacturer is allowed to sell cars which can go faster than that. Well, the answer, I'm afraid, is a trifle controversial, but you see, the faster the car, the safer you are. The 70 mile an hour speed limit was introduced in 1965, a time of the Ford Anglia. It had a top speed of 70 and is therefore exactly the sort of car the letter writers would like to see making a comeback. But now, let's see it trying to stop. is one of the scariest things I've ever done. Getting it to 70 miles an hour was bad enough, but stopping it took 244 feet. Now, that's exactly what it says it should take in the highway code, up here on the back page. But then the highway code was written at a time when everyone was driving around in Ford Anglias. The only thing this is good for now is clearing up the mess that I appear to have made in my trousers. How did anyone survive the 60s? Since the Anglia was pensioned off, cars have been getting a good deal faster. But that's okay because there have been big improvements too with brakes and tires. Three, two, one, bike. Now the Lexus is known to be one of the fastest stopping cars that money can buy and it certainly lived up to that reputation today. According to our computer figures, it went from 70 to naught in 2.8 seconds. It stopped in 139 feet. That's, that's 100 feet less than it should take according to the highway code. Unbelievable. Now the Escort did it in, in 198 feet, kind of poor to middling. But we can't change the highway code because the speed Kills Lobby likes to drive round in two-ton slow coach diesels like this Discovery, which took a staggering 224 feet to stop. That's um, 84 feet more than the Lexus. 84 feet. Big four-wheel drive cars undoubtedly have their place. It's just a bit further down the road than you'd like it to be. Now, this is exactly the sort of car that causes the speed kills lobby to reach for the battled and bond. The Porsche 911, 65,000 pounds worth of bulging Teutonic muscle. With a top speed of 165 miles an hour, they say it should be labeled a killer and banned. But hold on a minute. The brakes in this car are designed to stop it time and time again from 165 miles an hour. 
So let's find out what happens when we ask them to stop it from just 70. Ready? Build the speed up. Hold on to your hair pieces, everyone. So there you have it. If you must step into the road in front of an oncoming car, do please make sure the car in question is a fast one, because that way it'll be able to stop more quickly. And it isn't just... So that's uh, that part of that video. There is more to that video. You can watch it uh, on the lecture if you want later. Uh, as you can see there, there is a, ver a variety of braking distances depending on what the vehicle is. and so. Um, We'll talk through a little bit about uh, why those differences occur, uh, create some equations for where they come from. So obviously there is uh, some importance with braking, um, depending on the transfer from the uh, rear to the front axle. And again, when we looked at acceleration, we said that the weight transfers from the front axle to the rear axle because of your acceleration and that the center mass is above the tires. So the same thing applies when you, um, when you look at braking. So as you brake, there's a transfer of, um, of weight uh, on the axle from the rear or from the rear towards the front axle. So not all of that weight unless, um, I don't know if you've many have done this, if you add um, on your bicycle, if you basically hit the brakes too hard, you go over the front. Now, however, what's the most, if we ask the question, what's the most effective brake to use um, on a bicycle, you're going to find that it's the front brake. And be, that is because um, as you brake, you add more uh, weight or force onto that front wheel. Thus, you have more braking potential on that front wheel. You'll find that the ideal braking ratio is about 80, 28 percent on the front and 20 percent on the rear. So again, remember with the uh, kinetic versus static, as we've talked before, if something if your uh, wheel locks up, then you basically reduce the ability that that wheel has to um, uh, break and just because of the type of friction you have there. Um, <clears throat> another question there, which wheel is better to lock up if you're traveling downhill? So if you're traveling downhill and you're getting maximum braking out of the other one, what happens there is actually if you, if you lock up um, the rear wheels it has the potential actually to slide out from you. I don't know if you've ever done this mountain biking or on a bike coming on, uh, sliding on asphalt down a steep, steep hill, but if you apply and lock up the rear brake, it kind of weaves in and out behind you, and so it's trying, it, since it has less friction there, it's trying to actually accelerate faster than your front tire and get around you. So uh, that is that piece there, and the question is, what's the ideal amount of braking? The ideal amount of braking is to match the percentage of force um, on the front wheel and the rear wheel with the braking on the front wheel and rear wheel. So um, if you were to, obviously as you brake, you're going to get more force on the front wheel, uh, more force of that force distribution on the front wheel, and so you want to be um, braking enough on there to where we maximize the percentage on each side of this. And so we have a slide here, actually some uh, equations and then a slide showing some of this. So the, the max brake force, we can uh, utilize this equation here. This is for the front wheel up top and then for the rear wheel on bottom. And you have the coefficient of friction, your weight, the length of the wheelbase. This is again the length from the center of mass to the rear wheel. H is the height of the center mass above the tires. Uh, mu is your friction and your rolling friction. So what are we doing there? So that's basically saying that we're summing uh, summing the forces or summing the moments uh, around the center of mass and this is coming out with our maximum braking force here and you can do that both for the front tire as well as for the the rear tire there. <clears throat> so in order to develop that maximum braking force, the tire should be what we call the point of impending slide, and that's right before we lock up the wheels. Um, and so at that point, you're really getting the maximum amount of uh, braking into there because you're not getting into kinetic friction and you're not actually reducing the braking capacity by not applying the brakes hard enough. So what's that look like? Uh, or actually, I'm sorry, 
does the max breaking force change during the slide? And we'll say yes, it does. So as you as you slide, there's quite a few different uh, things that are changing there, and one of those is just is that you um, you're changing the distribution of that force. <clears throat> so what we want to find then is the basically the breaking force ratio, the maximum breaking force ratio between the front and the rear brake. And that percentage of breaking force ratio um, <clears throat> can be found with this equation here. Again, these are the dimensions on the free body diagram that we have. Just, again, distance from to the rear wheel from the center of mass, height of the centroid above uh, the tires, our friction and our rolling friction. And so we can basically calculate the the individual pieces here. <clears throat> this is the percent breaking force for the front, percent breaking force for the rear, and then this back here again was our breaking force ratio. All these are related. Um, <clears throat> note here that uh, because changes to passenger cargo and road conditions affect the breaking force distribution, basically that means if you have um, nobody in the car versus uh, other, you know, multiple people in the car depending on how they're, the weight is distributed, distributed you're just going to change the way that, that, that you break. And so if we take that, that last principle we talked about and look at a light truck versus a passenger car and we're going to change the load in there. This is down here we got two, two graphs. This one on the left is for the light truck and basically both of these are looking at um, looking at our maximum deceleration for front um, for basically braking ratio so the front braking force divided by the total braking force here and so <clears throat> with that front braking force with we're gonna look at the light truck here without a load versus with a load so as I add a load to there and you can see we've added uh, approximately 3600 pounds <clears throat> to this light truck here it, it drastically changes where the maximum braking force here is. So this is the uh, maximum uh, braking force ratio. So what this means here is that you're when you actually add load to it, it's just going to change um, how much percentage of force you want to add to the to the braking system. And so in this case here, we want the front braking system to be about or closer to 80% versus when it's unloaded, we want it to be um, more percentage to be more towards the rear brakes. Cast passenger car, though, uh, what you'll find is that doesn't change as much. Now this is now we haven't added as uh, much load here, but it's not adding or changing the braking force ratio as much as it is for a truck. For a truck, you can see obviously as we're changing uh, the the normal force on the rear tires, it drastically affects that braking force ratio. So if we're looking at how close we are to a maximum brake efficiency, we can take uh, the maximum deceleration we have and uh, basically divide that by the coefficient of road adhesion and get our maximum brake efficiency. This, this is very just a very simple formula. <clears throat> Again, you're going to get your max deceleration in G units. This is something you would calculate. And that maximum, actually, if you look at it, has a maximum of mu. And so uh, based on what you have there divided by mu, that's going to give you uh, your percentage for uh, maximum braking ratio. Now, ABS. So we talked about this briefly uh, last lecture. What is ABS? It's basically uh, the car detects wheel lock up and we... Uh, basically then trying to release the wheels, intermittently release the wheels in order to maximize the uh, braking force. So obviously braking force, one of the things we didn't talk about is actually steering capability. If you're sliding, you don't have the same amount of steering capability that you'd have if you are, um, <clears throat> if, if, you're, if you're locked up, you don't have that same capacity to steer. And so that is one option there. So just a quick question here uh, for the guys that drive in the snow. If you're sliding towards a car, is it ever good to let your foot off the brake? And so in, in a situation where you are sliding, 
the time where you do want to take off your foot off the brake is if you're actually sliding towards something. What you'll find there is if you release the brake, your wheels will start to turn again, and that actually uh, increases your steering cap capability. And so actually, by letting go of the bra brake, sometimes you can steer out of um, out of danger in some way. So you can, um, if you're going off the road, uh, you can sometimes release the brake, and that will uh, increase friction and get you back on track. So there are cases where letting your foot off the brake is good um, in if you're in a situation like that. Uh, here's a video for anti-lock brake system. I will let you guys uh, watch that yourselves. Pretty interesting video. And we get to our last couple slides here. Uh, theoretical stopping distance. So in order to calculate a theoretical stopping distance, which is drastically important, um, as you noted in the video from... Uh, <clears throat> talking about the, the very cars stopping at different times, and there's a highway code of 244 feet, uh, which has changed a little bit there. Um, but what they're doing is they're looking at kind of the most cars and getting them to be able to stop within a certain distance. And so where does that come from? And that comes from this calculation here. Um, we're going to start with this equation, basically summing uh, the forces on there and looking at the uh, mass of our vehicle. Uh, times ds, the distance over which that force will be applied. And again, we have this mass factor again, <clears throat> mass factor accounting for moments of inertia during braking. Um, basically, uh, that force that's going towards braking again, the same way with acceleration in deacceleration, some of that goes towards the uh, transmission and the rotational inertia in uh, the vehicle. So if we rearrange that and do some calculus, you're going to get this is your s, your theoretical stopping distance um, and we have this equation here so a little bit of a complex equation but again this right here is our s our theoretical stopping distance with the sum of the forces on your vehicle um, and after we pull out the mass we're integrating all those things so <clears throat> with these assumptions in here this is in the uh, maximum stopping distance. Is the effect on speed of speed on the coefficient of rolling resistance is constant. So um, we're just saying that that effect is constant. We're going to say that the vehicle comes to a stop, so V2 is equal to zero, and we're going to include the actual braking force in there. <clears throat> so also uh, in this, you're actually um, not looking at. Uh, aerodynamic resistance. And so in our problem, uh, in our next problem here, we're going to actually look at, uh, in class problem, we're going to look at what's the difference in stopping distance if we in, in, ignore aerodynamic resistance versus if we include that in there. And so this again just plays into how we look at uh, how do we evaluate equations when we have assumptions based on there. As engineers, we will always have assumptions based and in, built into our equations. And so what happens when we do and when we don't have, say in this case, um, our Ka in there. So you can see the top and the bottom one, this Ka value is present here. So it has aerodynamic resistance versus this one on the bottom does not. And how does that change on this scenario? So we will be working on this uh, braking theory problem uh, next week, so uh, or on Friday. And so we will see you guys on Friday.